So now we're going to get into uh, where we have multiple genes, okay? And the expression of one gene is going to affect the expression of the other. Maybe they're part of a biochemical pathway, okay? One's the first step or the second step or the, even the third step, okay? So this is going to change when we look at our um, Punnett square or fork line diagram, uh, what the final possible phenotypes are going to be. We're going to deviate away from that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio we saw before. So in our example with, say, the yellow trait and the um, smooth trait for peas, uh, we had two genes, separate uh, chromosomes, and they weren't interacting. The yellow phenotype was unaffected by the smoother wrinkled phenotype. Okay, And that's where we saw our 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio there. Okay, Now this can change based on whether or not the expression of one gene is changing the expression of another gene. Okay, So... This particular type of gene interaction where we have um, one gene determining whether or not the other is expressed is also referred to as epistasis. Okay? Um, other books get more into the different kinds of epistasis, but we're going to just leave it as, as epistasis here. So if the genes are interacting, interacting with each other, we're going to have a different phenotypic ratio than our 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Okay? So in this example, um, we've got basically a biochemical pathway here. We need one enzyme to convert our, for sake of shortness, our orange to yellow. Okay, we need um, allele A of our, of our first step gene. And then we need allele B here for the second step. So we need the dominant alleles are the functional enzymes. Okay, so a dominant allele A is going to convert yellow, uh, orange to yellow. And then a dominant allele B is going to convert yellow to blue. And that's, say, our pigment, our final pigment form in the end here. So if we have this cross, our F1 cross of our heterozygotes here, um, the majority are going to wind up with um, the full functional pathway. They're going to have a copy of the, of the functional um, allele A and the functional allele B. And that'll get us our 9 out of 16. Now, what happens is if in any case we have... Um, a homozygous recessive pair, that means that we don't have a functional uh, allele for that particular gene, so the step is broken. So if we don't have, um, if we have the recessive um, allele here, we don't get our yellow pigment and therefore um, this functional enzyme B can't do anything. Okay. Same here, if we have our functional um, enzyme for the first step, great, we get to yellow, but then it nothing happens and it doesn't get to the, the end of the pathway. And finally, if neither of the enzymes work, nothing happens. So what happens here is although we have different genotypes, we have different genotypes in these, they all get pooled to the same phenotype. All right. So we need the um, both copies of the functional and alleles for both genes, okay? Uh, and that's if we're missing any of that, if we miss any of the pathway steps here, uh, we're gonna get the same phenotype, all right? For different reasons, but still the same phenotype. So we're gonna see this um, nine to seven ratio when we need a functional, um, if we have a functional pathway, and then we get the seven, that, the seven um, possibilities that don't end up being functional, okay? So, these are still following um, like a predictive ratio, okay? So the genotypes are still there, but the phenotype is gonna change and we're gonna pool uh, our, our stuff together. So this is where we're actually adding as opposed to multiplying. We wanna know what are, what are the chances of this or this or this, then we add them together. We're gonna get seven out of 16 times um, for here as opposed to our 9 out of 16. 9 plus 7, 16, 16 out of 16. Cool, we're just double checking. We've got all of our uh, proportions there. So here's another um, type of epistasis, okay, where we've got uh, actually two different genes, okay, that can both carry out the same type of reaction, okay. So um, we're going to call this uh, the U U compound, and so we've got two different genes, okay, and the functional allele of, of this gene, the A gene, can carry out this reaction. It can make this U into a C, all right, and then we've got another gene that's called the B gene, and if we have a functional dominant copy of this, this uh, B enzyme will carry out the same thing. It'll turn this U into a C, okay. 
So it has kind of duplicate activities. Okay, we've got a gene that can do the same thing. And now, if but if we get for some reason we have neither of these genes, they both have the recessive non-functional alleles, then they can't carry out the reaction at all. So you're going to see uh, there's 15 different ways here, or 15 out of 16 of the uh, offspring of that particular cross will be able to carry out this particular uh, pathway function. And you'll have one, if you're a full heter heterozygous recessive and you don't have any functional copies, you're not going to be able to carry out that, and you're going to have just one single um, out of 16 that can do it. In this case, we're pooling all of the phenotypes that can perform this action. Okay, and so we're going to have, in this case, a 15 to 1 phenotypic ratio in this pair. Okay, like the other one, we have two outcomes. Does the process work? Yes or no, but the, ra uh, the ratios are different. So we're going to get into a particular example we're going to use a lot for like homework questions and assignments. And we're going to be talking about Labrador dogs because dogs are awesome and they're cute. And we get to look at pictures of puppies. Um, so Labradors come in three main colors here. We've got um, yellow labs, chocolate labs, and brown labs. All right. And the main, one of the main genes in this system is called the B gene. And this determines uh, the color locus. This determines um, what type of eumelanin is produced, so the black pigment like we saw in the agouti. And the dominant um, allele produces this nice super dark black black color. Uh, it's related to tyrosine um, protein, and so this is similar to the cat point color, which is also a tyrosine protein. And we've got mutant alleles, okay, which we're going to just, there's three different kinds, but pretty much they all have the same effect. Um, is the lowercase little b, we have a truncated allele that doesn't fully make this um, protein to convert um, uh, whatever the precursor of eumelanin is into eumelanin. And so that's going to give kind of a brown color as opposed to a black color at this color locus. Right. And now we have the second piece here is called the extension locus. So what this part does is it's this melanocortin receptor and so in this gene if you have a functional gene then pigment is expressed you get a black or a brown dog if you get a recessive mutation in this gene then the receptor can't deposit the pigment in the fur it doesn't matter what color pigment you had uh it's not going to get deposited in the fur you can see a little of it in their eyes and skin around you can see the um, just very light. We're not going to worry too much about this, but it's really cool. We're going to just worry with fur color is that you get either the, the brown um, deposition in the skin or the black deposition in the skin. So there's the, here are the two. Um, so this is if you have a full um, uh, homozygous recessive and here's if you actually have the, um, the, the, the functional eumelanin um, at the color locus here. But don't, just, for, just for fun, we're going to focus on fur color. So these are, this is a, a two genes that are interacting to bring about one particular phenotype, in this case, coat color, all right? So we've got E as our, this is our deposition, okay, whether or not any pigment at all is deposited, okay? If you have one functional allele, one um, dominant allele of E, then you will get color, um, color deposited, okay? And then B gene, only gets expressed, okay, you can only see it really, if you have a functional pigment deposition gene. Okay? And then, uh, so E is uh, being epistatic. E is, is being epistatic to the B gene. E is controlling whether or not we actually see what's happening in this other gene. So don't worry about dominant recessive epistasis. Mm -mm -mm. The, gene, the, the, the genes are dominant or recessive. We're going to say whether or not a gene is epistatic to another gene. If a gene is epistatic to another gene, it is masking or it is controlling the expression of that gene. All right. So here's our kind of uh, two gene model of, of Labrador coat color that we're going to be using in various crosses. And I'm going to make it a little more difficult. There's another locus here. We're going to be doing some three gene uh, crosses. And this dilution locus controls um, this other gene called the melanophyllin gene, okay, which is a transport protein. So this is, uh, mel melanin is produced in little cellular organelles called melanosomes. The pigment kind of fills up and then the 
the protein moves that to the cell membrane of the melanocytes and then the pigment gets deposited into hair follicles and such okay and there is this literally like a, a single point uh, mutation in the sequence for this melanophyllin gene okay and what it does is in this mutated sequence um, here so if you have a functional copy you don't see any dilution at all but if you have both copies of the mutant you get this lovely dilution of coat color you there's um, you get this lightened color you get this lovely sheen okay and so we have um, these these different colors of of our um, puppers here so this this gene this dilution locus is epistatic to both the E and B genes okay so it's going to determine whether or not you get the shiny dilution so here's our we're going to call them silver labs here up at top we're going to get our um, lilac labs here because they're just sort of a shiny lovely light brown and then we have our champagne uh, which is like a, a Labrador a yellow lab that's even lighter in color and even shinier okay so we have our dilution locus which is epistatic to the other two color genes because it's determining whether or not this gets applied on top of them now um, I don't know how people can be like breed racist against dogs but like there's this big thing in Labrador coat breeding where they're like there's only three colors those are all filthy mongrels and dilution is terrible and and okay dog breeders I'm sorry but all Labradors are super cute and fine like they're they're all adorable I don't have I don't know why there's a giant controversy there except that I guess breeders get really creepy about purity right so so similar to dogs in the, this melanophyllin gene uh, causing the sort of coat dilution and iridescence uh, occurs in other animals as well and I found this neat example in rabbits okay, where we have two different main colors we have the castor uh, patterning and the chinchilla patterning and then if there's a mutation in this melanophyllin gene you get this dilute coloration of both the castor and the chinchilla and looking a little bit in instead of a single nucleotide switch in this case we have a nucleotide deletion um, here where we have our TTG GAG shortens to a TTGAG we've lost a um, residue there okay so just a one nucleotide deletion gives you this pretty significant um, visible uh, difference in coat sheen and color so here's another example in this case we're actually going to take a look at what exactly happens in the DNA sequence and then what happens in the amino acid sequence so here's our avian melanophyllin gene um, and we've got um, basically our shorthand for the amino acid residues uh, which you don't need to memorize because you would always look that up on a chart we have R standing for arginine okay which is a has a basic side group and it also has a charge it's very chart um, so it's a positive charge yep and then we have um, W is our, our amino acid code for tryptophan which is a nonpolar aromatic ring it's not polar or charged at all okay so if we look at I believe yes this is the mutant one here where we have our, our residue residue tryptophan leucine um, forget what E is and then we have our wild type here which is EE and then arginine leucine E and we can see in our gene here the in this particular chunk of the uh, melanophyllin gene it's right here at this 35th um, amino acid residue where we get in the wild type we have the arginine and then in the mutation because of this T right here switching to a C right here we change the entire amino acid residue at that site and that one amino acid residue change is enough to swap our melanophyllin um, activity from this very very dark pigmented um, chicken feather to a very very light shiny chicken feather okay. so, and that's what we could they actually call this a lavender phenotype in chickens which is neat so this is sort of how the um, and this is going to um, on top of whatever particular color this chicken was if this had been a spotted chicken or a, a red chicken you would get this dilution phenotype being epistatic to any of those other genes affecting the um, feather coloration 